This lecture reviews the capital asset pricing model, CAPM. I know that CAPM is something that you guys are all familiar with, but here we're going to um, re-examine some of the assumptions associated with it. Um, and discuss how it applies and how it can or cannot be tested, that kind of stuff. So the assumptions generally associated with CAPM are that all investors are going to be price takers, meaning no one has no one is in a financial position where they can set the price. So there's no monopoly. Um, they have they all have individual are identical holding periods so when you're doing the discounted cash flow model everyone is assuming to hold it for the exact same amount of time um, the everyone is able to borrow and lend at the risk-free rate and there are no transactions costs or informational asymmetries so that um, there's nothing else that we need to add on to this cost. Everyone has homogeneous expectations that goes along with the idea of the identical holding periods um, for the discounted cash flow based methodology for figuring out what that appropriate price is. And then everyone is a mean variance uh, maximizer, meaning that you want to maximize your return subject to risk. So everyone has these exact same um, expectations. The result of these assumptions is that investors optimize their portfolio a la Markowitz. So what does that mean? That means that every single investor goes out there and they examine the risk return profile and they maximize their Sharpe ratio. So what was the Sharpe ratio? It was the rate of return on your portfolio minus the risk-free rate divided by a, uh, a risk or variance measure. All investors then end up with the identical input list for the efficient frontier. And since they all have the same risk-free rate and tangent capital allocation line, they all have the same optimal risky portfolio. So the market portfolio is an aggregate of all the risky assets and it has all the same weights. All investors will hold the same portfolio of risky assets, meaning that market portfolio, and where they fall along that capital allocation line uh, or capital market line then really just depends on their degree of risk aversion. The market portfolio contains all securities and the proportion of each security in the market portfolio is quoted as a percentage of the total market value. So all investors will choose to hold a portfolio of risky assets in proportions that duplicates the market portfolio. The risk premium on the market is proportional to its risk and average market risk premium. In other words, everyone tries to maximize their Sharpe ratio subject to their degree of risk aversion. And this results in um, the CML, the capital market line. Hold on. Sorry about that, you like my ringtone? Okay, um, so this results in maximizing the um, capital market line. Now, the difference between the capital market line and the security market line, which is what you're seeing here, SML stands for security market line. The security market line graphs the individual asset risk premiums as a function of the asset's beta. So now beta is on your x-axis. Beta becomes your risk measure. And what beta is showing you, um, you're a well-diversified investor, so you don't really care about the standard deviation of each individual asset, which would include both its diversifiable and non-diversifiable risk or systematic and firm specific risk. Um, you're assumed to be a well-diversified investor, so you only face market risk. You've diversified away all of that firm specific risk. You're only left with the systematic risk. And therefore, um, how your stock reacts to changes in the market is really the only thing that you're concerned with. So beta becomes your risk measure. And that's what we can see here in um, figure 9.2. That's the security market line. You are your uh, Y intercept. So we have risk, risk measured as beta relative to return on the Y axis. So expect a return. Your Y intercept is going to be your risk free rate. The beta of the market is going to be one and um, this is going to show the slope of the risk-free line. 
So assets are fairly priced if they plot along the security market line. If they were to plot above the security market line, as we see here in the second picture, then it would have a positive alpha. The alpha is the difference between the fair value, the fair risk return value, where risk is measured by beta, um, and what return you're actually receiving. So for cap M to be accurate, stocks would not be expected to have an alpha value on average or that alpha value would be equal to zero. So that's the difference between the cap M and the single index model. With the single index model, the beta coefficient is the same as the beta of cap M, but um, cap M is about expected returns, which are in fact unobservable. So when you do the single index model, you do actual returns. Cap M is about expected returns. Um, and if cap M holds, then the realized alphas should be equal to zero on average. Extensions of cap M include consumption-based cap M, where human capital is added into the model. So some of you are going to be presenting papers on that idea. We'll also hear about some tests for CAPM. And in general, what we see is that CAPM fails on average because the average alpha value, the average um, extra return is not equal to zero. Um, therefore, some would say that CAPM fails. Other would others would argue that no, it's not that cap M fails, it's just that cap M is this very eloquent mathematical model that's based on all of these assumptions. And in reality, um, these assumptions don't hold, therefore it's just going to end up with estimates. So some would argue that cap M itself is not really testable because there is no real market portfolio. Um, we estimate a market portfolio, we use the return on the S&P 500 as a proxy for the market portfolio, but does that S&P 500 really include every single asset that's in the market? No, it only includes 500 US stocks. So um, that's one of the things they'll talk about. And then the idea that we use historical data um, when we're trying to predict expected things, you know, we talk about the idea of fundamental versus technical analysis in 495 and technical analysis is based on the idea that history repeats itself so that forecasting is valid. When you see something happening in the past, you can extrapolate that it will continue to happen in the future. But if we truly believe that the market is a random walk, um, then that should not necessarily hold. So that's um, some of the things that you guys are going to be presenting to us in some of the papers that you'll be presenting.